All right, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Thursday, March 3rd of 2022. Tray Day, at, as uh, FanDuel at least is calling it. Maybe that's a thing. I don't think I've heard of that before, but I kind of like it. They've got some massive NBA contests, or at least one massive NBA contest over there on FanDuel today. A uh, $3.33, 150 max with about 175,000 lineups, entries in it, uh, at least as far as I can tell, 133 grand to first, and then uh, 25 grand or something like that to second. Uh, I've got I've got some entries in it. I'm, I'm bashing on the uh, prize pool, but I'm pretty much always down for a lower stakes uh, flagship contest. But anyway, happy trade day, I guess, uh, to kick things off. Uh, we got a couple... Questions in our queue here for today already. Uh, definitely some kind of nuanced questions, some more theoretical uh, strategy kind of questions, at least as far as I can tell, coming in early. So uh, should be some fun stuff to talk about, break down a little bit, get into it here. Um, before we jump in, I will mention, as I always mention at the start of this stream here, if you've got questions for me, ask them in YouTube chat, ask them in the office hours channel in Slack. Those are your best two ways to do it. I try as best I can to answer questions in chronological order. So get your questions in now. I'll get them answered sooner. Uh, we'll get the app pulled up. We'll start talking here. Uh, actually, I want to start here today uh, with a good question, question that I think is just a good way to start the show off here. Uh, and this is from Jared. Um, and he said, can you explain the differences between contests with their lineup builds using randomness and variance? Is it safe to say uh, the 150 max needs more randomness or, or variance than a 20 max contest. Thanks in advance. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, in general, the larger a contest is, um, the uh, more you're going to see this sim variance slider go up. And also the higher the entry limit, uh, the the broader the entry limit for for how many lineups one person can play, the more that variance slider is also going to go up. So uh, for a given contest, 10 to 50K, right? You can almost kind of just see this play out. Single entry variance is at six. Uh Three max also at six. Oops, get to 20 max, jumps up to seven. 150 max goes to nine. Uh, why is that? I, I I think, first of all, uh, I think the question is, is it safe to say that? And the answer is yes. Uh, but I think maybe briefly we'll talk about why that is, uh, why, why that trend uh, happens here. And, and one thing before we jump into that, I think is always worth mentioning here is that uh, the, the sliders themselves are not just what we think they should be. They are back tested uh, against past contests that have ran by building, you know, thousands of lineups at each possible combination and seeing where the highest EV is uh, for lineups built at a certain setting. So um, that is not to say they are perfect by any means, but it is to say that they are data driven. They are back tested. Uh, so we can, um, in some ways, kind of count on them or, or rely on them to at least be kind of generally true or directionally true, and then talk about why there are trends that we are seeing. So the sim variance slider, right? This is ultimately going to control how diverse, how volatile your lineups are by looking at the number of simulations used to build each lineup. So a lineup built at sim variance zero is going to be a lineup built based on the entire pool of simulations, essentially the full range of outcomes of every single game uh, averaged into one average number, which is the projection for each player, right? You're going to basically build the highest overall average projected lineups you can. At sim variance 10, you're going to pick a single game simulation and build the optimal lineup for that single slate simulation, really a single game sim of every game on the slate and build the optimal lineup for that particular slate sim. Now, in reality, on the actual slate, the real basketball slate tonight, they are only going to play every game once. There is one, there is actually going to be one particular outcome for every single game on the slate. There is some theoretical actual optimal that will exist at the end of the slate tonight. There will be a lineup that is the maximum number of points that you can score that exists. The spectrum of sim variance as you move up and you're talking about larger and larger contests can be thought of as a way of describing how close you need the lineup to be to win a particular contest to the hypothetical actual optimal at the end of the night. Right. Uh, in other words, uh, and this is this is one of the many ways of looking at sim variance. I think there are other ways to define it, or I think there are other ways to kind of functionally think about it. But I think this is a good one for this question. In other words, uh, as your sim variance slider comes up, 
it is basically saying that for these particular contests, your lineup to win that contest needs to more and more closely approach the actual optimal that will exist at the end of the night. In a single entry where people are likely to play a little safer, right? They have less overall lineups to diversify, right? They are going to, the, the winning lineup will likely have a lower overall score. Uh, and you actually kind of see this, right? There's a little bit of a condensing of ownership in single entries as well. The pool of lineups in these contests uh, is, are generally a little bit more unique. Uh, it is harder to capture all of the outlier events that ultimately end up leading up to that optimal, right? Uh, in a 20 max, and this is keeping entrance content, con constant, right? This is exaggerated as the contests literally get bigger. This is just looking at entry limit. As you give people more lineups, they take more chances, right? Uh, in a, or put another way, people aren't interested in going all in on their favorite plays on the slate. And as, if you give somebody 19 additional lineups past their single entry, they are likely to diversify across those 20. And as they diversify, they play players that maybe are projected worse on average, uh, but obviously have a very high ceiling themselves. And the overall highest scoring lineup in that contest gets a little bit closer to the optimal. When you give these players 150 max lineups, right, uh, that effect is continued to be exaggerated. Uh, the other factor here is that the players, generally it is more skilled players that enter more lineups into a contest in a very general sense. Uh, as you give more, as you give more bullets to uh, each individual player in the contest in the form of entrance, right, they're the overall skill uh, the overall accuracy of the average lineup in the pool goes up. The scores become higher because the a greater percentage of the pool is being dominated by lineups from more skilled players. So uh, anyway, I mean, again, coming back to this question, I think this was just a really cool one to start with. Yeah, you do see uh, a general trend that sim variance goes up as your entry limit and your entrance increase. Um, it's important to remember that uh, I, I don't want to say this is empirical. Like, I don't want to say this is necessarily like purely scientific, but when we see these trends uh, in the sliders, we can somewhat kind of take them as uh, very being very careful about not saying fact here, but we can, we can take them uh, at face value, I guess is maybe a good way to say it, because we know that these have been uh, kind of proofed with backtesting and then explain them. And, and in this particular case, we see that as contest gets bigger, uh, the need for a lineup to, win that contest, it needs to approach the theoretical optimal at the end of the slate. And to do that, our variance slider goes up. Just one way to think about variance, uh, probably more on the theoretical side, less so on the practical side in that particular case, uh, but a fun question to get things started with here. So great question. Let me know if that makes sense. If I lost anybody, if anybody was confused by that, always feel free to ask questions. That is why we do the show live. Uh, I, I, uh, do not just sit down and record answers to these questions and email them or send them out to individual users, right? We do the show live because I want I want follow up questions and clarifying questions when I lose you guys. Uh, but let's uh, let's keep it going for now. So, um, a question from Tone Nine Thirty here, uh, three part or three parts here. So what we'll do? Let's uh, we'll paste this in one by one here. When I've been pasting the entire question into YouTube chat to pull it up on the screen, it's kind of getting out of whack lately. So we'll break this down a little more. He said, Jordan, question about pre-build exposures uh, versus after build, step one versus step three. So I've been experimenting with research builds in MBA to give me an approximate optimal percentage. Uh, I know you mentioned research builds are not as valuable in MBA, but then I take the optimal percentage for each player and plug it into a formula, which gives me a min max window of exposures I'd be comfortable with for each player. Great. Sounds like a cool idea. I like it. Um, off the bat, I would say you're, uh, I'm just going to make a comment here before I even answer the question. Uh, your biggest challenge there going forward is going to be speed. Uh, how quickly can you replicate this if you need to, um, if news breaks just a few minutes before lock, that's that I think your, uh, your process here sounds great. Um, but be careful. I guess one thing you could do is just open up your exposure windows on players that are affected with news breaks. But, um, that's the one thing I think anyway. Um, that's not the question here. So uh, the question is, uh, do, do I think it's better to upload min or max exposure in step one to get a build I like, or is it better to just use the max exposure I come up with in step three to cap players and let Saber naturally give me my lineups? If step three is the recommendation, do you think in the future you guys would give me the ability to quickly upload exposure in step three if that is even possible? No, I would do this in step one. If you've got exposure windows uh, for every or for most or for many players in the slate, give us that information up front. Uh, we'll be able to build you a pool that is going to be much more 
flexible um, in, in, in the step three process to kind of fine tuning. Um, there's kind of two ways to break step three, basically, and say, uh, get the message that you need to build more lineups. The first is really aggressive. The first and the obvious one is to make really aggressive changes, right? You build your lineups in step three, and then all of a sudden you start clicking the lock button on guys you had none of. You start excluding guys you had 100% of, right? Very obviously, there's not going to be a lot of lineups that fit that very quickly. The second way, and I think the, the less common way that you can kind of cause problems in step three, I call it a death by a thousand cuts, right? If you go into step three and try to set a minimum or maximum exposure, even just tweaking every player a slight bit from what you got automatically, but you do that to every player in the slate, you're going to see eventually that you have to build more lineups just because you're making so many adjustments that there's just simply not a big enough pool to get you there. So when you put those min and max exposures in in step one, uh, it will be a lot closer to what what you are looking for in step three. And then, I mean, the other thing that's nice about that is we do have the ability to upload minimum and maximum exposures here with the custom projection upload in step one. It saves a lot of time there. So um, I don't know, to be completely honest, if bulk uploading ex exposures in step three is something that we're planning on doing. We are talking about uh, being able to export exposures from step three so that you could use them elsewhere. Um, I don't know if we're planning to import exposures in step three, mostly because that's not really, that's not really the intended use case for this. Like the, we, if you're doing this type of process, we would want you to put that information in, in step one. Um, so I think that's probably the easiest way to proceed there. And then there was another question here, question two. Uh, and this says, um, Question two says, do you think late swap entry editor can also in the future give us the ability to upload exposures so the late swap builder uses them as guidelines of what you're trying to do more or less with your lineups? I know it won't be exact, but at least the builder can respect those guidelines. Uh, yes, I, this, that answer, like that exact solution is probably not what's going to happen here, but we know this is a pain, right? It's very easy for, so let me start here. When you fill your build with the entry editor, we will we will pull in the exposures that were used from that build. So if you take a process of uploading your min and max exposures, building lineups, then filling those lineups into your entries, those exposures will port over at every step of the way. But it's fragile and uh, it can break easily. If, you've cha if you change your number of lineups or anything like that in step three, you can lose those exposures. If you upload a new entries file into the entry editor, you can use those lose those exposures. We know it's fragile. We know it's a little bit annoying. So we're not going to have the ability to upload exposures into the entry editor, but we are actually actively talking about entry editor improvements. That is just going to make this whole process a lot easier. So I can't, uh, I don't know, I don't have much more to say about that at the moment, right this second, about what that's actually going to look like. Um, but the goal here is to smooth out the entry editor slash late swap experience significantly. Um, I would say kind of as our next bigger overall project to the app. Um, you know, we've obviously got all the things going on with new models and new sims and new minor features coming out here or there. But as kind of our one of our next bigger projects, we're expecting to do kind of a, a pretty big streamlining of the entry editor tool. So a uh, lot, lot included in that, but Brad's here. What's up, Brad? Welcome. Um, cool. Let's keep it going. JRT's got a question here. And he says, can you talk about pool size? Sometimes I see it run at 500, other times 1500. Is that based on the size of the contest we input? Yeah, it is uh, generally... I actually think by default, it's always at 500 here as the default value. I don't think uh, there's any way to up it to, or I don't think it uh, by default, anything updates it to 500. It used to be 1500 for 150 maxes. Um, I would still recommend updating it to 1500 for 150 maxes. Uh, I don't know if we brought it down to 500 on purpose or not. I think you can get away with 500 lineups in a pool still for a 150 max. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the pool size, you know, it will work for most builds at the 500 mark. Um, if you need a build to complete extremely quickly, I think you can be justified in bringing it down a little bit, right? It takes a little bit more time to build more lineups. If you're not worried about time at all and you want to build a larger pool, maybe you're planning on making a lot of adjustments or you're building, maybe you're playing 300 lineups, right? 
in that case, I definitely recommend bumping it up to the 1500 mark. So uh, short answer, 500 is fine for most use cases. If you're not worried about time and you're either building a lot of lineups or going to make a lot of adjustments in step three, build a bigger pool. If you are worried about time and you're not going to make any adjustments in step three, you can justify a smaller pool. But for me, most of the time, I normally just end up cranking it up to 1500 just so I have those lineups there. I don't do that all the time, right? If I'm playing a single bullet, I don't need 1500 lineups behind that. But a lot of times I'm playing like multi-entry stuff, 150 maxes, 20 maxes, you know, maybe 200, 300 entries. Um, I, I like to crank it up and just use it at, at 1500. So, but cool. All right. Okay. Let's keep it going here. A couple questions uh, in Slack and uh, let's, let's get them in here. Okay. This is from Joe here. He said, uh, last week we talked about editing projections in step one and how it relates to their percentiles. The system adds slashes subtracts to the percentiles, but does not show the increase slash decrease in step one. I forgot if you had mentioned this holds true in a build by sorting by the percentiles. Uh, that is, I increase a per player projection from 31 to 38, but in my build when sorting for 85th, the 38 points uh, will show while all their projections have the 85th. Is the system using an 85th increased how should we account for this? Okay, so this is this is a bug, actually, I think is what you've kind of actually stumbled upon here. So at the moment, right, we, we did talk about this last week. When you change a player's projection, if you increase a player by three points, for example, we increase his output in every single simulation we have for that player by three points. And then we use that when we use the sim variant slider, we use those updated sims with the new custom outcomes. The percentiles themselves are stored values that don't change when you update custom projections. So they don't change on step one. And in fact, uh, the bug that you've kind of come upon here, Joe, uh, is that you're not actually, uh, custom projections and percentiles are mutually exclusive. You uh, can't use both of them at the same time. Um, and um, so if you change a custom projection, for example, you should, so you should see a message that percentiles are not compatible with custom projections, and then this should be disabled. Right now it is still enabled, and you end up in the situation that you've just described here, where if you change the percentile to 85th, every player will have their projection changed except for the players that you set custom projections for, which is no good. You don't want to do that. Um, so um, that is uh, that is that. So that's a bug. We will get that fixed. And... For now, uh, don't use don't use the percentiles here um, if you are uh, using custom projections. So, um, Andrew asks an interesting question. Uh, don't know if I have the most satisfying answer for this, um, but he said, "Are you aware of any publicly available Twitter lists for different sports news, or have any yourself?" I'm not. Um, it's a good idea. Honestly, I like my Twitter game could probably get get a lot better. Like I'm on Twitter a lot, but I don't use a lot of the features. I know people have like really cool lists and tweet decks and all kinds of things where it's like you've got your DFS analyst desk feed, whatever, where it's like all of your all of like, I guess, like almost touts or just like advice and general strategic ideas. And then you've got your like beat writers for news. And then maybe you've got your news aggregators like underdog uh that stuff's all pretty cool i like i just got everything all in one feed i've got all of my different interests floating around too like my tft stuff and my dfs stuff is is all mixed together so i'm not the best person to ask for like uh good twitter lists and good twitter setups unfortunately i probably uh could stand to learn more from people that use twitter a little bit better than i do already again like i'm on twitter um and i and i like it but i i don't think i'm super optimized uh for it but um there are i mean i know there are lists you can search lists on twitter so people probably have some of this set up like if you try searching like nba dfs see what kind of pops up scroll through the list see who's in that list see if you recognize some names and i think that's a good start so cool all right Cool. 
Let's keep it going. Uh, I see these questions in YouTube chat, guys. I promise we will get to everything. I'm going to continue to knock out the last few questions that are in our Slack first. Uh, so while I'm on this point, there's a link to join our Slack community in the description of every past Office Hours video. There will be one in the description of this video uh, when it gets posted as a recording to YouTube. Uh, I always try to answer for the most part the questions that come in in Slack first. So if you want to get your questions answered earlier in the stream, highly recommend joining up in the Slack. There's also obviously great conversation going on in Slack every single night. Um, but let's go ahead. I want to get to this next one here. This is another question from Joe. This is a fun one, especially for baseball. Um, so uh, I said, can you talk about correlation between players? Sometimes I feel uh, some of the negative correlation is counterintuitive for players when you expect a high scoring game, uh, whether they be on the same team or opposing teams. Are you aware of any trends in the NBA that supports some correlative aspect? Yeah, correlations in NBA are very interesting. Uh, they are they are pretty one of a kind. On average, your correlations are going to be a little bit lower in NBA. Um, you often will hear NBA described as a lower correlation sport. Uh, the main reason for that is because it's not an event based sport. Uh, there are not significant events. For example, a quarterback throwing a touchdown to a wide receiver is such a significant portion of both of those players' fantasy points expectation for a given slate that it creates a very high correlative. Uh, effect, right? Um, so you have these naturally very high correlations in a sport like football that doesn't really happen in NBA, right? Uh, Luca can hypothetically, you know, assist a particular player on his team on a basket and both players score, but that's not a significant portion of that those players' expected outputs. There's also a lot of more diversity of the way. It's very easy for other players on the Mavs to score without Luka being involved in the play altogether. Maybe not so true for Luka with his usage rates, right? But in general, that's that's in generally true, right? Uh, wide receiver, uh, apart from maybe a rushing touchdown, is virtually never going to score points without the quarterback also scoring points on the same play. So kind of a lower on average correlation sport, right? Uh, the most meaningful correlations that you typically do see in basketball are negative correlations. Uh, players often are somewhat negatively correlated to other players on their same team, uh, especially if they occupy a similar role on the team. So we see, right, Luca's most po most common negative correlations are to Jalen Brunson, Spencer Dinwiddie, right? The players on his team that play the same position. Um, and the main reason for this is because there's an opportunity cost to everything that happens on the court, right? If one player scores the basket for that given play, no other player can have scored that basket, right? Uh, if a player gets an assist on the basket in, in NBA, right? Not, not so much in NHL. No other player can get an assist on that basket. A rebound can only be collected by one particular player. And this there's only so many baskets and assists and rebounds that are going to exist in a certain game, right? So you are essentially pulling from that hypothetical hypothetical bucket of available baskets to score, which creates these kind of soft negative correlations between players. Now, that does not mean necessarily that in every game outcome, players have strong negative correlations with one another, right? If a team goes to overtime, I think is the easiest example to see and maybe that team, by virtue of getting to play an entire extra quarter, uh, that team goes over 15 points over their implied total, right? At that point, in that particular range of outcomes for a game, those players may have positive correlations together, right? In that particular game outcome or that particular set of outcomes, right? Um, or just in a very high scoring game overall in general, those players may be uh, positively correlated to one another. So um, overall... The impact that this has on your lineups uh, is that we don't measure, we don't value the average correlations overall too much, right? They are relatively small compared to other sports. Those correlations that I actually just pulled up for Luca are some of the largest I have seen. Um, I typically typically don't see them get too much larger than like negative 0.15, but we don't value them too high. And I think the biggest way to get correlations into your lineups naturally in a more in a way that better reflects the variety in the types of game outcomes and the way players are correlated differently in different types of games outcomes is the sim variance slider, right? So a common idea I've talked about here before on things like NFL showdowns, you'll hear me say sometimes that the correlation is naturally 
already present within the sims. That's something Matt also spoke about a little bit in our most recent NASCAR strategy session. Uh, what we mean by that is because we are simulating games out play by play, we naturally pick up on what players are likely to succeed in a single lineup together because we understand what players are likely to succeed together on the court, right? So the correlations are naturally going to come up when you're building an NFL showdown lineup, for example, right? If you have a wide receiver and you're using a single game simulation for that build, you have a wide receiver in the lineup. If the quarterback is in the lineup, that's great because the quarterback likely had success since that wide receiver had success. And if the quarterback isn't in the lineup, that's also still probably okay. That's only going to show up at the rate at which that kind of outcome is optimal because there are op there are occasionally lineups where a wide receiver can be successful without the quarterback in an NFL showdown kind of lineup, right? That's kind of the idea here. Since we are pulling from simulations for your NBA lineups regardless and looking at, at these individual game scripts for how games could play out, uh, we can get away with, in general, not valuing the average correlation as much in a sport where average correlation is already generally a little bit lower. So that's kind of the way I think I would say in, in broad strokes, my NBA correlation, um, I don't know, rant, I guess, right? So when you hear somebody, you know, you may hear on other shows, people are talking about like stacking up a game, right? What they are actually really saying and, and why I actually think that's not as sharp in NBA as it is in other sports is what they are trying to do is identify a very narrow range of outcomes for that game where players are positively correlated to one another, right? You may hear someone say, I'm stacking the uh, Kings and uh, Spurs game tonight. Well, those games, those players are going to have probably pretty good projections, right? This is looks like the highest total game on the slate. You may get a lot of those players together in your lineups anyway because they are just projected so well. But somebody that is intentionally going out and stacking in of on that particular game in their lineups is trying to spotlight a narrow range of outcomes where those positive correlations exist, right? Which is also generally the upside outcomes for that game. If this game does go well over the implied total, it's likely that everybody in the game is going to benefit, and that's why it it makes some sense. Um, but that does not mean that on average, the players in this game have strong positive correlations to one another, right? In fact, you know, there's probably very few positive correlations in this game, period. So um, I... Uh, I know last time I talked about this, I remember I, last time I kind of talked about why I don't really like intentionally game stacking in NBA. Um, I had a few people kind of fire back via DM and via uh, uh, a few other channels and give me some opposing points of view. And, and I'm open to having my mind changed here. I'm not a big fan of, of that level of stacking beyond what you kind of naturally get in your lineups for, uh, for NBA in particular. I think the most valuable kind of correlation to key into in NBA overall is the negative correlation that you get between players on the same teams. And I think that's pretty well captured overall um, in your, in your lineup builds naturally with the default sliders based on using the simulations and the, the correlation slider. We did last note on this and then we move on. Uh, we did recently update our default sliders for NBA, increasing the correlation slider uh, by one tick for every classic slate size. Uh, the reason why is because we've put a ton of time into our NBA Sims this year. We feel our NBA correlations are really sharp, uh, much more accurate than they were at this time last year, and feel like we can get a little bit of an additional edge and feel like there's a little bit of an additional edge to have or to be gained by increasing your correlation slider a little bit. Um, I think it's kind of intriguing, to be honest, and I have been kind of exploring the option of maybe even knocking this a little bit higher. Um, I, I wonder partly if there is a little bit of an inefficiency here. I, I, I wonder partly if the field um, doesn't realize or isn't taking advantage of uh, these negative correlations as appropriately as they should. Um, one of the things that is difficult about NBA, I know I'm kind of, I know I'm going kind of long on this question now, but uh, I guess I have a lot of thoughts on this. I think one of the things that's difficult about NBA correlations in general is that you can't really just capture them with a single rule or a very simple rule. In NFL, or in NFL, you can basically say, give my QB two pass catchers in every lineup on any optimizer under the sun, and you're automatically going to get better lineups than you would have otherwise. Uh, in baseball, you can say, give me all of my DK lineups 
five man stacks and your lineups are automatically going to be better than they were before, because that is really all it takes to get some level of correlation in your lineups in NBA. It's really hard. You have to kind of understand uh, at the very least how teams play overall, right? What, what players occupy what positions. Um, and then you would have to go in and set player groups for every single theoretical player that played a similar role on the same team, whatever, right? You'd have to group out your Luca from your Brunson and say, don't use these two players together and then move on to the next team and, and continue going from there. Right. That's, that's hard. And it's, it's uh, kind of a pain to do that for every single team on the slate. You don't have to do that here. Um, and I, I, with how hard that is for people to do uh, quickly and efficiently and um, intelligently on a traditional optimizer, there's a part of me that has been interested in increasing this correlation slider a little bit more. Um, so alien DFS makes a really good point. High projections with negative correlations, perfectly fine. Yep. I agree. And that's, I think that's the other side of the coin where I think correlation can get overweighted is people will take a team where there is elite value, right? Uh, like the Raptors, uh, a couple other nights ago with the Van Fleet out, right. Where just every, every player on the team was projected spectacularly, uh, at that point, the the minor correlations between these guys of negative 0.1, you know, fantasy points really doesn't matter when every player has at least a 6x average projection. So, um, yes, I agree there as well. And that's that's kind of where the balance is um, of, of that correlation on the NBA side. So, anyway. Cool. Um, okay, I have one other question here. Um, in Slack, and then we'll hop over to YouTube chat. Jack actually asked this, and Jack, I might need a little more help, so I might need to kick this back to you, uh, and then you maybe can uh, give me a little more context. Um, the question says, can you explain the difference between a player's actual sim and the same player's percent outcome? Um, I am a little lost on this question, so maybe maybe you can give me a little bit more context on, on what's being asked here. Um, and then I will, I'll come back to you here before the end um, and we'll cover that. But I, I've got a lot of questions in YouTube chat here. So um, rather than trying to take a stab at that, I'm going to jump to these questions uh, in YouTube chat. Give me a little more context and we'll come back to you, Jack. So, um, and we'll go to this question from Eamon. Uh, how would you approach this 333 contest on FanDuel? Need a strategy uh, for a Saberson member to take this down at night? Yeah, uh, well, you know, set set low expectations, right? This is uh, this is just a fun one. Um, 100 and whatever it is, 178,000 lineups, uh, probably like what's the price for a third to first? Um, and then it, it drops down. Second place is a fifth or, or yeah, probably about a fifth of the overall uh, prize to first, right? So a ton of variance in this contest, definitely just a fun sweat. Um, first of all, uh, definitely going to want to be pretty aggressive here. Um, I will be building, um, pretty aggressively with my variance, uh, ownership fade, uh, correlation comes up for this, this kind of contest by default, which I think is interesting. I kind of like that overall. Um, I will not be afraid whatsoever of seeing a particularly strange name in a, in a given lineup, right? Single game simulations here at the sim variance 10 level. Uh, I'm happy to take some shots. I think I've got 30 lineups in this thing. I'm not maxing it. Um, so I'm playing for a little bit of a sweat, uh, a couple things that I think can be valuable, um, without going kind of too far into specific slate strategy, uh, ownership fade is going to come up to four. I think since we're actually up at that 180,000 entrance range, I think there's some argument to be made about raising this a little bit higher, uh, maybe five, um, maybe even, you know, potentially six, but if you do that, I think it would be wise to spend some time studying the ownership projections, make sure you, that you agree with them, that you think that they're in line with the way that this slate, uh, where the chalk's going to go on this slate right now, not a lot of value here, right? It's the middle of the day. Uh, not, not a lot of value. I, I think we are likely to get some with the way that the injury report, uh, is looking, but at the moment it's going to be kind of a tough slate to play because, you know, these slates where there's not a lot of value um, can play out kind of randomly. Tough to tough to get an edge on these kinds of slates. Um, so uh, I guess, again, a couple things so far, right? I would be aggressive with my sliders. I would be pretty comfortable making some pretty significant stands. Um, 
I like the idea of spending a little time studying the ownership projections, making sure that you have a, you agree with where the projections think the chalk is going to go, dialing that in a little bit where you think it's appropriate, and then taking the opportunity to crank up the ownership fade. This, you don't need to go crazy with the ownership fade slider, but turning it up a little bit, I think is a good idea. And then finally, pay attention to the weight swap opportunities, right? Um, especially, you know, there's a couple, there's a late game tonight. Um, the biggest edge on this particular slate might be playing weight swap the right way especially if this is one of those slates where we don't have value early, right? Like let's say Trey plays, right? Um, let's say we get like, you know, Trey Young and Van Vliet are in at lock and we still have a lot of other questionable players on the slate, right? Even LeBron questionable down at this late game. If the average projections look like this going into lock, I will probably urge my lineups, maybe set a stacking rule uh, or something like that to try to get some exposure. Like, one thing I could see myself doing is setting a rule to say, uh, give me three players from this game. Not actually to do that, but to preserve late swap flexibility for when I'm kind of ready to make my make my move, right? Like if, if our best overall projected play on the slate going into lock is a 6X Trey Lyles, I'm going to be a little bit more interesting try, interested in trying to play an angle where somebody like Jimmy Butler uh, or or maybe Holmes um, who's been out quite a bit or, or LeBron or somebody, somebody gets ruled out after lock that gives us an opportunity to get some late swap edge. And I think a good way to do that would be to set a rule requiring a certain number of players from the last game on the slate. And then maybe, you know, maybe that news breaks at five 30, right? Maybe we get Jimmy Butler out at five 30, right? Well, then you can take the rule off and then late swap. And you know that every lineup has at least three players to work with in it. Uh, that might be a, a good ticket for tonight. Uh, it's a, it's a huge contest. It's a heavily promoted contest. I think it's going to play soft. I think overall, the overall skill level in this contest is going to be low. I think you can get an edge here, but it's going to be so high variant. So um, I would I would play with with um, with that in mind as well. But um, so yeah, I guess kind of like three edges there, similar to the edges that I think just exist in NBA on a nightly basis. But um, for this kind of contest, high variance, right? Uh, spend some time studying the ownership projections. Make sure that they're you, they're they're going to be very good by default. But if you've got a sense of where chalk might be going that the ownership projections aren't picking up on, make a couple adjustments. Maybe tick up the ownership fade slider just a tad. And it, especially, either way, you might want some late swap flexibility on tonight's slate. But especially if there's no value at lock, I love the idea of doing that for tonight. Right? Um, so... But it's also entirely possible that Trey Trey Young gets ruled out and uh, Butler gets ruled out and Van Vliet get ruled out all before lock. And in two hours from now, like there's just value on every single team on the slate. So, but good question. Um, so, cool. All right, let's keep it going here. Uh, Brad said on showdowns like tonight with Brooklyn looking pretty different than when it did before the all-star break. How much do you trust the Sims? Um, broadly speaking, I would say situations where teams have changed, where the lineup construction of the team has changed quite a bit. Um, I think are good opportunities to at least be somewhat skeptical. So it, I, I think they're good opportunities to research. Um, we have had the opportunity to see the Nets play together since the All-Star break a bit now, but I think this is KD's first game back. Um, and you can see, like, there's there's reason for skepticism here, right? Uh, obviously, a lot of times for this for a lot of time for the Sims to continue to dial in, but we've got a very low projection for Kevin Durant at the moment. And I that seems low to me. Um this is a situation where it's inherently going to be a little bit harder for any model to project. What does the new usage look like for kind of the new look Nets, uh, but with KD back and no Kyrie, still no Simmons, right? Like it's inherently a little bit of a harder situation to project. Um, I think it's fine if you looked at this and said, no, I kind of want to trust the Sims and roll with it. I think it's also fine if you said, this is a situation that's difficult to model. Uh, this doesn't look right to me and I'm going to increase KD's projection just for example, or do whatever else you want. Um, but I think you were on the right track by picking this game and this team uh, of one, like, is this an opportunity to make an adjustment, right? Um, you know, let's go over and look at, um, at this point in the year, are there any teams that are just playing like they're totally normal, right? Uh, the Warriors is a good example, right? Looks like 
so no Draymond, but he's been out for a while. A lot of data of what the Warriors look like without Draymond. A team that I think in general, here's actually, this is actually a great example. I am more, I would say I am more skeptical of Kevin Durant's projection being low than I am Steph Curry's because the Nets are playing differently. Their team is is different than they were the last time KDA was playing basketball. Whereas the, the Warriors have their, uh, their relatively typical starting lineup here tonight, right? So I, I actually would be inclined to believe that Steph Curry is just pretty heavily overpriced, whereas I think Kevin Durant's projection might be low. And I think you spotlighted that perfectly with, with picking up the nets there. So, um, But again, uh, it's early in the day. The individual projections of players and teams and things like that will continue to dial in throughout the day. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I like to think about that. So... And then Brad said, can you uh, just discuss contest selection, what you consider a good contest versus not? I'm, I apologize. I'm sure you've covered this a ton. Uh, I'll give you the quick answer. Um, we actually, we have covered this in a lot of detail, a lot more detail than I can do on this stream on our YouTube channel. Um, so for NBA in particular, we have right when you get right at the top here, our, our 2021 NBA DFS course. This first video, it's about 40 minutes long here, is a very detailed discussion into contest selection. Um, I actually go into the lobby on DraftKings and FanDuel and actually literally, I think there's a spreadsheet in this video too. And I literally write down, I would play exactly these contests first, then these, then these, then these, and it go from there. Um, overall, the, the summary of that video is to play 5% maximum of your bankroll amongst any correlated slates you're playing that night. So if you only play the main slate, that's 5% maximum in the main. If you play of the main slate and the night slate in a couple showdowns, that's 5% total on that given night, right? Um, the idea also is to play the lowest entry fee contests you can, spread out your risk as much as possible by getting as many entries into the lower dollar stuff before moving up in stakes. And in terms of individual contests, we like to spotlight contests that have a thousand or more effective entrants. Effective entrance is the total number of lineups divided by the number of the entry limit for that particular contest. And the reason why is that the greater number of effective entrants there are, the softer the contest is going to play. There is a finite number of skilled players in the lobby any given night, and those players are typically entering a lot of different contests, and they're typically maxing those contests out. And you can dilute the impact that they have on your contests by making sure that there are more unique individual people in them. Those contests are harder to win. This is a little bit unintuitive because those contests have a lower raw probability of winning on any given slate, right? You have a lower raw probability of winning a 20,000 person, 20,000 entry, 20 max, than you do a 2,000 entry, 20 max. But you're ROI over the longer term will be higher in the bigger contest because the opponents are softer. So that, that is kind of the summary of this video. Um, I would say the one thing that I have been, I have changed this year and I have kind of been talked into, and I think I will adjust our content for next season, um, is if you aren't already, I would explore the opportunities of playing some of the other slates on a given night. And instead of going all in on the main slate or 5% all in on the main slate to spread that out amongst other contests where you can. Uh, in particular, if you don't want to play everything, because I know that's a lot, doesn't schedules don't always work for people. In particular for NBA, the night slate and the night showdown are always very good, great, pretty good contests there. Um, bigger contests, they, they, they grade out pretty well. Um, if you are playing these other slates, even I play everything. So I'll be playing all of these slates tonight. If you are playing other slates, you are going to have to sacrifice the effective entrance thing. The contests just aren't big enough to justify getting in them. What you gain in, in sacrificing the effective entrance is you, uh, you smooth out your variance, right? You essentially silo and isolate games and situations where you might have been wrong on, right? Let's say hypothetically that you nail the entire slate tonight, right? Except for this first game. This first game, we have it at 116 to 158 or 115. Probably the builder is going to give you a lot of players from this game, I would assume, by default. And in reality, we get like a 92 to 89 slugfest. And all of your lineups that include players from this game are dead, right? But every other game, you nailed it. 
Well, on a typical main slate, that's probably at best going to be like maybe a break-even day, maybe a 2x day. But if you play other slates, right, you probably are giving yourself an opportunity to crush the night slate, the night showdown, maybe the other showdowns here, maybe the 730 turbo, right? Because you have isolated this game and you've kind of diluted the impact of being wrong on this game to just the main slate and, and potentially the showdown for this game, right? So you can you can smooth out your variance by playing more slates. So that's one of the things that isn't really directly covered in this video that I would also recommend if your schedule can support it. And if it doesn't directly, if, it, if it's not possible to, to do all of these slates in a given night, I would at least explore playing the, the night slate and the night showdown because the contests for those are pretty great. So... Um, so let me know if that helps. Um, I see a lot of conversation here in the, uh, in, um, chat here. I'm going to keep going. We'll get to questions here and then we'll, we'll get kind of caught up. Um, Brad said on bankroll management, I know the typical is about 5%, but I feel like if I don't play, I may miss an opportunity. 5% is our, our maximum on a given set of correlated slates. I wouldn't, I wouldn't play more than 5% tonight, like probably about total, um, at, at least until you really feel comfortable that you kind of know that you are a long-term profitable player. Um, and even then, you know, going over that is is quite an investment um, and, and potentially increases your risk of ruin by quite a bit. So I, if you are a, a really good way to look at it, I think is if you are really sweating the individual results of one night, you probably played too much. One, one night of DFS should, uh, sweats are fun. It's fun to win. It sucks when you lose, but it should mostly be that. Like, dang, I lost. That sucks. If you are upset at the end of the night, you played you played too much volume. So, um, but I, I like that 5% number is a, good, is a good number to stick at. So Dante was in the uh, run peer stream that I was doing just before this. So welcome back, Dante. He said, uh, I made the rookie mistake the other day of reserving all my lineups under one team and then tried to late swap 20 lineups, but it would only let me late swap the one lineup I had. Is there a way around this? Was a total accident and literally rushing on time. There's not a super good way of doing it at the moment, unfortunately. Um, it kind of depends on what your lineup is. If it's just a reserved blank entry, right? If you have no players entered, one thing you can do is just X out the two players or the players playing in the early game and say you're building at like 530 then actually not a late swap, but actually go in and build a new set of 20 and fill this as if lock was 530. And that would work, right? But if you have a dummy lineup in there that has players from the early game in there, like say you've got like DeRozan or something is locked into all 20 of your lineups and you have 20 dupes around him, you have to really the only easy way to fix that or to resolve that is to... Um, lost my train of thought, is to kind of manually tweak your, your lineups on the site and then re-download the entries file. Um, I mean, there's a couple other little like hacks you could do if it works out. Like if you have DeRozan and he's locked into like the shooting guard spot in every single lineup, or wait, what position does he even play? Is he a, he's a power forward on DraftKings and only power forward? That's really weird. That's like very strange. Why is that? That's mind boggling to me. I did never notice that before. If he is locked into the power forward slot in every lineup, you could theoretically lock him in, exclude the other players playing in this game, and then do the thing I talked about before. But um, it's it's a little bit kind of a pain either way, unfortunately. So, uh, Johnny says, can you explain exposure and what is too little and what is too much? Yeah, good question. So when we say exposure, we're, we're basically referring to the percentage of, of lineups that you have in your pool with that player in it, right? So if we pull up this build here, take a look at this. And I'll get a moment to catch my breath. Okay, cool. So let's, let's reset the percentiles back to average as well. And... Okay, so exposure, yeah, is is the percentage of lineups that you have with a certain player in it. So we have, when we say we have 90% exposure to DeWante Murray, that means 90%, 18 of our 20 lineups have DeWante Murray in it. Um, there isn't, I would say, in general, a rule of thumb that you can say, 
uh, is too little versus too much, right? It's it's compared. It's on a per contest level, right? Um, and it's also generally best compared to the projected ownership for a particular player, right? If the field has 26.4% exposure to DeWante Murray, we don't really stand to gain anything in the 26.4% of lineups that we have that also have Murray in them, right? Because as, as he succeeds, our lineups that have him in it are going to go up, but also the same percentage of lineups in the contest have him in it as well. The only lineups in our set that are poised to succeed when Murray has a good game are the 63.8, 63.6% of lineups that we have more than the field does, which is why I think exposure in generally is best thought of against the field. So um, you can use that as kind of a, a barometer of, of how much exposure maybe is too much, right? This leverage column is exposure minus ownership. So we are saying that Dewante Murray at the moment is the play on this slate that we are most confident about. Um, and if that was not true, we could lower our exposure to him, right? Meaning that we are less like literally exposed. We are, we are taking on less Jawante Murray risk, but we also stand to gain less when he succeeds, right? It's kind of very similar to like the investment in investing way of thinking about DFS is that as we take on less as we take on more Dewante Murray risk, our upside in the event that he succeeds goes up. But we also have a much more, we, our portfolio of lineups is much more risky on this on this particular kind of investment, basically. I, I like to think about it in the investment terms here uh, when I'm thinking about exposures. So, um, but the other side, I, I mentioned it briefly and then kind of glossed over it. The other side that comes into play is, is your individual contest you're playing. Uh, and in, in two ways, one, if you're playing a three max, there's only four discrete exposures. You can have to one player. You can be 0% exposed. You can be 33% exposed. You can be 66.6% .6 exposed or hundred percent exposed. There are basically four settings you can be on any given player, right? In a 150 max, there are, uh, 151 different discrete levels of exposure you can have to a particular player. So you can be very specific about your exposure. Uh, but along with that, there's a difference in overall strategy, right? In a, there is a difference. The percentages ultimately mean different things when you're playing different contests. So for example, right, if we were 20% exposed to Dewante Murray in this contest, right? Let's use that again as an example. That means that we have, um, four individual lineups with him in it, right? Well, we could be 10% exposed to DeWante Murray in a 150 max, but have 15 different lineups with him in it. So the percentage, the exposure percentage does not always necessarily tell the whole story. Uh, in general, I think you'll see a general trend, and especially if you just experiment with building lineups on SaberSim at different default settings, you will see that as the number of lineups in your pool goes up, uh, the top overall exposures in your player pool will go down mostly because there aren't often there, there can be, but in general, you don't need to have a hundred percent exposure to certain players in 150 lineups, right? You can get enough equity. You can get enough lineups down with that player in it where it's efficient to move elsewhere when you're playing that many lineups. But if you build just three lineups on Saber Sim, you'll probably see that there's like a couple or a few players or even four or five players that are in all three pretty regularly because you only have three shots in that particular contest. So anyway, that's kind of a, I guess, a little background on, on correlation or uh, getting all mixed up now. We already talked about correlation on exposures. So excuse me. Uh, John says, now that Saber Sim is providing significant value with NASCAR projections, sport with significantly high variance, do you think a similarly high variant sport like soccer is possible? Uh, yeah, it's on our list um, as far as being able to simulate it. Soccer sims are are on the list. Uh, it's tough. That's a tough. That's a tough sport to sim. Um, that's team sports are always a little harder. They take a little bit longer. There's there's kind of more just that that I guess in effect the actual kind of correlation of the players on the team. Um, team sports can be a little bit harder to to build out sims for. Um, and, and soccer is just kind of tricky. Um, one of the things that's nice about 
you know, other sports. Football, you have a play. Uh, even in basketball, you, in effect, have a play. You have a possession, essentially. Um, in baseball, um, I think we do things on a per batter level, but baseball has a ton of discrete elements. You can kind of do on an inning level. Uh, you have an at bat. You also have individual pitches, right? Uh, soccer doesn't. Soccer has possession as well, but it's it's not as necessarily clean cut as basketball is, and and those sports get hard to kind of simulate. Um, that's just one of the reasons why it's difficult to simulate it is because breaking it up into discrete elements to be simulated is hard. Uh, unless you just do the whole game, which has its own kind of its own issues. Um, like even League of Legends, uh, we ultimately can kind of a lot of our League of Legends model is based off of events that can take place, right? There can be a kill, there can be a tower taken, there can be a dragon taken, there can be a baron taken, right? If you don't if you don't follow League, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. But there are still a lot of discrete events, and they happen often enough that it breaks the game up, right? In soccer you have the goal scoring event, but that's not even something that's guaranteed to happen very often. Um, or even maybe the very is likely to happen very often. It's, it's just a very difficult game to simulate, but it is on our list and we want to provide support for it. And I, for one, am very excited about it. So, um, but yes. All right. Um, Eric said, Hey Jordan, best settings for the 150 build on FanDuel in the one in the 333 today. I talked about that a bit earlier. So I'd, I'd rewind to go check out. I kind of gave a brief breakdown on strategies I think I would uh try to employ for tonight's slate. Um said I love slates with no value, makes it better if you're not a casual. I'd I'd push back on that. Um I I actually think that uh slates where there is no value, where there are not big salary inefficiencies, make the game harder to play. Um, even in a sport like NBA where average projections are pretty good and there's also a lot of average projections out there, there's still a lot of cash in the pool of people that aren't building lineups with projections at all. Um, on a slate like tonight, the edge that you get over those players is smaller because you, this, the, the game, at least at the moment, again, right? Projections will likely change, but if this was the slate we had at lock, it's, it's too random. There's too many, what you want or what I want when I go into a slate is I want there to be clearly, I want there to be mines. I want there to be a kind of like landmines out there that if you, if you do the wrong thing, you're building a bad lineup where like there are players that you kind of need to have, or you need to have certain sets of these players, or there's obviously right ways to play the slate. And on a slate like tonight, that doesn't really exist. Um, maybe if you play in a really, you know, exploitative way and get a big ownership edge in your particular process, maybe you like these slates a little bit more, but I, I find that they're tougher. So, um, I'd also push back here, actually just going, catching up on some of the chat here. Best contests are high dollar single entry contests. Uh, again, I, I don't, I don't agree. I think those contests can be kind of tough to win. Uh, they, they, at the higher dollars, right. You're going to attract a, a better overall player. Right. Um, and these contests are going to play very sharp. They're also going to be very high variance, right? You only have a single bullet. You have a single line. Uh, if I'm playing 150 lineups on a given slate, right, versus one, I, I'm essentially getting 150 opportunities. I'm getting 150 times the opportunities than you're getting in this one given lineup, right? Now, I know a common, a very, a very common thing I hear in the DFS space is that, like, to compete with pros, you you have to play like single entries and things like that. And I, I don't think that's true. I think that comes from the fact that if you're using traditional optimizers, it's very hard to build good a, a good set of 150 lineups. On SaberSim, it's very easy to build a good set of 150 lineups. So you might as well take the opportunity, drop down and stake significantly, right? If you're playing $100 single entries, take that $100 and play 200 unique lineups because SaberSim makes it very easy to get those lineups. Spread out your risk, spread out your variance. At worst, worst case scenario, you will be able to find out that your process is not working more quickly because you have more data to work with, right? If you are playing a single bullet every night, it would take you multiple seasons to have enough data points to actually know if you were good at DFS or not. If you're playing a 200 entry, 200, not even entries, 200 lineups a night, you can tell within 
at least some degree of accuracy within just a couple weeks or a month if what you're doing is actually working based on your top equity, top 1% equity in your contest. So I would I would push back on the idea that best contest to play are high dollar single entry. Um, I don't think they're the worst contest to play. I think high dollar single entry is probably better than maxing the $15 fadeaway on DraftKings every night, which is a brutal contest, a very difficult contest to be successful in. Um, but I, I think you are better served playing as many entries as possible at lower stakes before moving up in stakes. If you told me you were playing $100 single entries, I would at least hope to hear that you were also playing all the low stakes multi-entry stuff that's available to you. That's my take. So, um, but um, HC said, hey, Jordan, for a single entry, what do you feel is a good number of players for a player pool to make a lineup? For a single entry, I wouldn't take any players out of my pool. I would, I would leave the pool wide open um, and then and then see what kind of – what I would do is I, I would not remove any players from my pool. I would use the single entry settings, right? But So say it's like a 5,000-person single entry, but instead of building one, I would build like 10. And the reason for this is I would like to kind of see what a couple different options look like for successful lineups. So um, – you can build, we're actually building 500 here, but you can see the top 10 and you can kind of get an idea of like what the, what are the core plays for your single entry lineup? What are the plays you really should use? And where do you have a little bit of opportunities to make some choices, right? Um, so, you know, you can kind of see eight of the top 10 all have Dewante Murray, Derek White, DeAndre Hunter, and Trey Lyles in them. From there, you have some options, right? And you could you could even kind of build out the rest of your lineup Right. Maybe you could, you know, you could even actually go in and lock these guys in. Is DeAndre Hunter was the next piece, right? And then kind of build the rest of your lineup together. Right. Maybe you don't want to play Marcus Smart and Derek White together, even though they're both projected well. So you could like remove him and then kind of like let the rest of the lineup come to you like this. This message here, in this case, we have we only need one lineup. So we can bring this down to one and then kind of kind of let the lineup come to you that way. But I don't I don't think you need to go in and like curate a player pool for yourself before you build because you can you can basically do it here. So like this, I actually think this is a, a pretty playable lineup. Maybe you don't want to play Robert Williams and Horford together. Um, so, you know, maybe you move remove Horford. So maybe something like this looks pretty good, right? kind of kind of pieced it together as we went along without curating a pool. So um Brad says fan DraftKings and FanDuel don't allow those players at three bucks and below correct. Yes, that is true. Um so but um cool. Uh, Brad says, I just want to point out also, since joining Saberson, I didn't realize how little of a chance I actually had at any opportunities to win it as just an everyday player. Um, I don't know. I, I think this is kind of worded in a way that maybe I don't entirely agree with here. I think. So I think there's a couple things. First of all, I think the DFS space in general of like 100K screenshot land on Twitter gives people the impression that there are people out there winning every night. And that's not the case. Everybody that plays GPPs loses most nights. You can just look at the payout structures and just know that, right? If 20% of the field gets paid out, even, even above average players are only even, you know, making money on an individual lineup about one out of five times. So most people are losing more often than that. Um, there is still an edge. The edge, the edge just presents in having 1% outcomes, one and a half to two to maybe two and a half percent of the time rather than winning every single night. And I mean, this, this reads to me as almost being kind of as, as hopeless if this take is taken in the long run on an individual night, your expectation should be to lose over the course of a season. Uh, you can absolutely be profitable. And I think there's very much still an edge that exists in DFS. Um, I think Sabersim is very well built to exploit those edges, right? I mean, there is seriously no better tool out there that's going to do a better job of 
building lineups with win equity right out of the box without making any adjustments than Saberson. There is value to be added by making adjustments, but the, the main part of it is putting yourself in a position to be successful by managing your bankroll, playing good contests, and being patient more than anything. So I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know. I, I This question reads as um, maybe being a little negative and I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it that way. So, but Eric said, quick question. Can you show the easiest way to late swap on FanDuel? Yeah, I can. Um, let's go over there. I'll have to get some entries downloaded here. Um, so let's, let's do it. FanDuel is a little more annoying because I have to like go over here and get the, get the file, do this whole thing, but maybe it's a good demo, good opportunity to show it. Okay. And we're also going to need to do the, okay. And now we need some lineups. So let's do this. All right. Okay. Thank you for being patient here. Just going through the, the steps of getting the lineups in. This is, so this is, I guess I should maybe narrate this a little more rather than just sitting here awkwardly in silence. This step of the process would be what you did before lock, right? So what we did is we downloaded our entry file from FanDuel. We uploaded it to SaberSim's entry editor. Now we're going to load our entries back up and we're going to fill our entries with our lineups. Um, but we are going to do that only once the entry editor loads. Maybe we need a little refresh here. A little, a little jump start. The process for what it's worth is basically the same on FanDuel and DraftKings. I probably could have just demoed it on DK, but um, since this said FanDuel, might as well do FanDuel. Okay, here's our entries. And we'll get our 150. And in this case, I'm just going to use a rank fill. Thank you for being patient with me. My computer's picked a very choice time to slow down on me. Okay, so now we're going to download the entries, right? So this is us uploading our entries for lock. We're in. We go grab our beer. We sit down on the couch to watch some ball, right? Now it's 30 minutes later. It's an hour later. Time to late swap. Go in, click the swap button, click late swap. You're going to see a familiar looking page here, right? The build settings page should have your group stack settings, everything you set before lock. Make any changes if you want. A lot of times I leave things about where they are. Um, one thing we've recently added is this option, only swap lineups containing out players. Uh, I would actually, I, I would basically never use this for NBA, but it can be useful if you're doing something like NHL, right? No need to go in and rebuild and reswap your uh, Avalanche stacks because the Vegas Knights have a slightly different line or somebody skating on the second power play on some other team is out, right? So that can be useful for NHL. But for, for basketball, I would leave that off. But anyway, you go in, click late swap 150. In this case, I have 150 lineups. It will make you a new build, rebuilding your lineups. In this case, the slate hasn't started. So they're like basically completely rebuilding each lineup. And then we can uh, download this, this entries file on the other side here. So another thing that's basic uh, recently been changed, um, or I guess for for those of you that have been around for a little while, re-added back in is this ability. Um, one, you can now see what the original lineup is. So if you hover, you can see original lineup, original salary. Um, two, you can see this will actually sort and it'll show you what lineups were changed and what lineups were unchanged. Uh, as more and more games lock, 
your line, some of your lineups won't be able to be changed. So they will just say unchanged. But anyway, we click download new entries. And then the one other thing on FanDuel is that after after lock passes, you handle your you handle your business in the live tab on FanDuel instead. So you go over to live, um, and then there's typically a button that says CSV edit right in the middle of the page. Um, once the there you go. So there'll be like a CSV edit button here that you can click and upload your file to there. So cool. Hopefully that was helpful. Eric said, love these office hours. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I mean, I definitely, I did not mean to um, come at you or anything like that either. Um, happy, always happy to have some discourse back and forth because I don't, I don't know all the answers to this stuff, but I noticed a couple, couple things that I just disagreed with there. So, uh, but Jay said a uh, quick question. Do you recommend specific team selection example, NBA and target a few games for point selection or run all games other night, the max score was 422 and couldn't get close in Saberson without stacking. Um, I, I wouldn't, I, I typically don't kind of for the same reasons we were talking about before, right? I don't, I don't like to specifically target teams to stack up or games to stack up because there are not very strong positive correlations in um, in basketball, right? There are game events and game outcomes where a maybe teams are positively correlated together and a stack is optimal. The rate at which those events happen is automatically naturally going to be expressed in the Sims when you build your lineups, right? Like if we go back here, right? it is likely that we are going to have some lineups here that have some team stacks or maybe some game stacks in them, but there's no need to force stacking in because the, the correlations, there are not very strong positive correlations between players, right? We have some natural game stacks showing up here already. It looks like Sacramento and San Antonio is the best overall game environment at the moment. So that's kind of showing up naturally here. I would not go beyond and force that. Um, and kind of more to this point of, of this example from the other night, I would also be very cautious going in and back testing and optimizing to a slate that has already passed. There is only so much you can learn from doing that. Um, I would, I think it is a better idea to, you know, try to see if you are going into a slate with a certain set of assumptions or a strategy that you're going to take, check to see if the basis of your overall strategy was accurate. But if you spend time optimizing, for example, for the March 1st of 2022 NBA slate, you're ultimately probably just going to end up figuring out exactly what you should have done for that slate, but that's not always helpful or predictive of what you should do in the future when you're when you're looking at like one individual slate like that. Uh, that I think the best example of 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 a way that explains this concept in a little better way is if you truly wanted to figure out how to build the optimal, the best lineups for a particular slate that already passed. The best way to do that would be to download the actual scores from each player and upload them as projections. That would be a surefire way to do it. Now that's not really helpful. So kind of figuring out how to rig the optimizer to have given you optimal lineups for a slate that already passed is just as unhelpful. Um, review and the process of kind of reviewing your overall process, I think is strong. But optimizing for a slate that already happened in the past, I, I don't think is super helpful. Um, another thing, this is uh, an idea from, from Shady Advice in, in Slack that I really like. Uh, uh, another process of review that I recommend would be sitting down and writing out your process, like actually on a sheet of, sheet of paper or in like a document if you want to use a computer. Write, write down every step, then write down how long each step takes, and then write down why you're doing it or what you gain out of that particular step. And... If there are reason, if there are things in your process that you can't explain or outliers in the time it takes to do it, those are maybe good opportunities of opportunity of opportunities to make your process a little more efficient. I think those are better processes of review um, than optimizing for a slate that already happened. So, but good question. Um, Josh says you can max the one dollar on DK for twenty bucks. Yeah, great contest. Always play that. So. John says, for NHL projections, given the importance of lines and power power play lines, if we notice there's something off about a player's line or if there's a late change, what would you suggest? Manual edit to projection. Um, yeah, you could bump a you could bump a skater if they're on a, a lower line than expected, like bump them down or up if you need to make a quick change. Um, I think that's I think that's great. We will be generally pretty quick with that. Like when we when we get information from our 
data providers that a line has changed, we get a new SIM out, I would say pretty quickly, but if you need to move fast, yeah, make an adjustment. Um, I mean, you can also change the lines here too. So like if the line information is wrong, you can change it here, which won't change anything other than potentially your stacking rules. Um, but yeah, you could, you could bump players up or down, you know, as needed. Um, especially if you're in a pinch, uh, again, we do, we do update pretty quickly, I would say, but NHL news kind of flows a little slower. It's not as, in my experience, it's not as well oiled of a machine as the NBA news cycle is, uh, it's it, you just get you just get news kind of late and then it gets to providers late and it just kind of circles around late. So, I mean, there's been situations where, like, if you get lucky enough to see the right tweet from the right beat reporter, you can definitely be on something 10 or 15 minutes earlier than the like news aggregators for NHL. And in that case, yeah, I would I would feel empowered to make an adjustment if you need so. But um, I, I mean, I will say, you know, within reason. No, I'm not even going to say that. I'm going to leave that there. Uh, Dante said, real quick, Jordan, in order to use the unique rank setting, do I first have to change the number of lineups in step three? Or if building for a 20 max, leave it and it will give me unique from the 500 I build. Um, a couple notes on this. Let's talk about this here. Want to address a couple points from this here. All right. Sorry, I got distracted. Let's talk about this here a little bit. Um, and I'll explain what this unique rank does, because I think there's maybe a little, maybe a little confusion here. So, so let's say you're playing, you know, a couple different 20 maxes here, right? So I have more than that in my file for DK, but let's say we're only talking about the 320 maxes, right? If you want to use the unique rank fill, you need 60 lineups here to avoid duplication, right? 60, right? In the, if we if we wanted to do that, we could use a 20 lineup set or a 60 lineup set. I'm sorry. Let's go and grab our lineups here. Let's go to this build. Oh, this is that single entry. That's fine. That's not a big deal. Let's do this. Let's make this 60 lineups. And let's also give ourselves a 20 lineup set to work with too. Okay. Okay. So let's do kind of a quick demo here, a walkthrough. Okay. Um, okay. So. If we do a 60 lineup fill uh, using the unique rank fill method for these 320 maxes, what's going to happen is lineups 1 through 20 are going to go in the and 1. Lineups 21 through 40 are going to go in the quarter jukebox. And lineups 41 through 60 are going to go into the dime time. Right? If you just used a 20 lineup build, it's going to say there aren't enough lineups to fill uniquely. 40 are going to be duplicated. And what it's going to do is it's basically just going to put the top 20 into every contest. So if you are, let me read this question again and make sure I have this right. So if you are going, so I guess the other, okay. So the uh, one other question here, or the one other way I think this kind of, maybe I'm interpreting this here is if you only have one 20 max, it doesn't really matter what your fill method is because you only have 20 lineups. Like the fill method, the fill method really only, applies if you are filling multiple contests. And at that point, it's saying, how do you want to handle these other contests? Do you want to just put your top lineups into everything? That's rank. Do you want to put a unique lineup into your contest in order of the Sabre score? That's unique rank. Do you want to just randomly fill all these with all of these lineups? That's unique random. And do you want to only fill contests where the number of lineups in the set matches the number of lineups in that contest exactly? That's exact match. So the fill method only really matters if you are filling up multiple contests because it is the rule that determines how we handle the additional contests. So let me know if that helps. But 
Um, okay. Um, 194 said, I'm the guy who asked about DVP the other day. Same day I trusted you guys, used projections from a certain percentile, and fell 26 points from first place in the $15 GBP and others. Going to try my exact same process tonight with bigger buy-ins because I doubt it was luck. I'll update accordingly. Uh, that's great, but also be careful, right? Uh, I would proceed with caution. Um, one one data point, one slate is is always is only one slate. Um, there's only so much you can learn there. Um, I I don't want to scare you off, um, but I actually. I think the, the given results on a one particular slate actually almost certainly are luck um, for one for one slate, right? Like one one slate is lucky. Uh, profitable season is is skill. That's kind of the I think like the DFS idea. So um, again, congratulations. But I would uh, I wouldn't go like all in or anything tonight um, on the heels of that. So play play within uh, play within your bankroll, but. That's great though. And let me know how it goes. So um, Eric said, I never understood going back and studying past lineups. Is there any merit to doing this in your process? This is an interesting question. I don't want to blanket say no, because I think there are productive things that you can do about going back, reviewing your lineups and, and, and learning. Um, I don't do it that much personally. I don't, I don't think there's like a ton of value for me to do it. I think you are better off reviewing your process the way I described before. I think your time would be better spent like writing down, you know, write down your process, write what you do every night. Um, ch maybe check your assumptions that you used, right? Um, you know, maybe you, maybe you go under on Trey Lyles for this particular slate. That's your approach. Because he is not a very he's he's the best value play on the slate, but he's not in a in a in objective terms a great value. And at the moment, Holmes is questionable and projected to play. Like right, he's he's projected in, um, and maybe you fade him. And at the end of the night, Holmes plays and plays thirty minutes, and Trey Lyles plays his normal workload, but gets hot from three and hits five of five and ends up being an elite play still anyway. And it's chalky, right? And you lose, right? That would be an opportunity. I think you can kind of check your process, check your the way you thought about that particular situation and arrive at the conclusion that despite the results, your process worked. What I would not do, what I would be careful of doing is like looking at lineups and saying, oh, if I played these three guys instead of those three guys, I would have banked. And then trying to force some like pattern recognition in to see what could have led you to play those three guys. And that's how you end up hearing rules like when I play two 9K players in the lineup, I always have two 4K guys and a 5K guy in because somebody at some point looked at a past lineup they played, figured out what the players in the lineup, what lineups, what players they could have added to that lineup to bank and then created a pattern that wasn't there. Though that's dangerous. That's where I'm, that's where I would be very cautious. Um, so, um, I would be careful there, but, um, yeah, but I don't want to say that it's, it's a bad idea. I think there's, there's still things I, I, there, I think there are productive things you can do with looking at, at past lineups, but I would just be careful. So, um, Johnny said, what's a good sim variance for tonight's three game, three entry, or should I keep it as preset? I would use the preset sliders for virtually everything. They are back tested. We build thousands of lineups at every single slider combination and then actually back test against historical past slates that have run to see what builds the best expected value lineups possible. Put in a lot of work to these. I would roll with the defaults. So. Eric said, I always fill my rank and sometimes it gives me a dupe. It should never give you a dupe as long as you have enough cont lineups, right? If I use a 150 lineup build, if I use a 60 lineup build and fill by rank, it's going to say there's one, the mini max has more than 60 lineups in it. You have to dupe, uh, but it won't dupe otherwise within a given contest as long as you have enough lineups there. Um, but otherwise rank, rank is literally intended to to dupe in between contests, right? You are doubling down. I, I'm putting the my top 20, my identical same top 20 in all three of these on purpose. That's that's the goal of rank. 
Uh, if you don't want to do that, use unique, use either of the unique options. So, but Johnny says, what's the best way to create 20 very unique lineups for a quarter jukebox? I've been using the core and it hasn't been hitting. Yeah. So a core naturally is going to make you pretty condensed, right? That, that is what, what a core essentially does is that it makes you very heavily exposed to a very small set of players. And you can build a core around the best projected plays on a slate, for example. And if those plays are successful, you give yourself a lot of opportunities to build the right lineup around it. Um, that said, there are certain slates. Tonight is a good example where if nothing changes and we don't get any value, I don't know if I would like to use a core in a 20 max because there's not a lot of plays that I think are deserving of being called core plays tonight. Um, if you are playing... 20 lineups and you want to be pretty diversified, you want to be pretty unique. I would first explore, you know, turning up your sim variance slider a bit. That's going to naturally incorporate a bigger range of outcomes for each individual game. It's going to give you more diverse lineups. And I would also uh, spread out your maximum exposures on step three. So we'll build this here and I'll show you what I mean. So again, we turned up sim variants, so we're going to get kind of probably a little bit more diverse lineups anyway, but we're still getting 90% Dewante Murray, and maybe that's too much, right? That's that's 18 of our 20 that have Murray in them. If he has kind of a bad night, right? And let's actually, let's look at this. If we click on Dewante Murray, yeah, he's projected for 56 points, but I mean, there are outcomes where he scores 40 or less, right? Actually, probably about 15, 20% of the time that happens, right? That might be too much exposure to us to feel comfortable with so let's turn his owner let's turn his exposure down right I, I think you asked about exposure earlier right this is this is kind of the point of that right now we have less upside if murray goes down but we also are taking on less risk here so now this is a pretty diversified pool of lineups and we can actually um if we make two adjustments here we can see the lineups right so now this pool of lineups is going to be pretty well diversified for for this contest so at the, this doesn't necessarily mean this is the guaranteed bink button, but it means that your lineups are probably going to have a wider range of outcomes. You're less likely to just totally brick a slate playing like this. So, but Eric said, is there a way for me to get the top percent guys in my lineup and filter it that way? Uh, what do you mean top percent? Um, I don't, I don't, I am a little confused. I don't know what you mean by top percent. Maybe give me a little more background. Um, Jared said, before unique rank was available in Saberson, how would you decide to place lineups if you're playing Nichols and the 222 on FanDuel? So need 175 lines. Um, I was and am still actually using rank fill for that personally. So I would put the top 20 or 25 into the 222 and then have the additional 150 fit backfill the the nickel. Um, I think it's fine to do the unique rank fill instead to play um, your top 20 or 25 in the um, 222 and then the next 150 in the nickel. I think that's fine. Um, but I... I'm just, I, I, I mostly, I like 150. I think 150 is a good number. I like editing my exposures from 150 and I will typically just rank fill them in. I'm okay doubling down a little bit on those top 20 or 25 personally, but that's a, kind of a personal risk tolerance choice. So, but 19.4 said, I'm not going to go all in. I, I do appreciate your honesty. I'm not drawn to it being luck due to how your guys' system is orchestrated. Injuries, fouls are the only thing I feel could be harmful. We shall see though. Uh, I also involved the safety net from other percentiles. Yeah, I mean that sounds good. Just as long as you're you're playing playing smart. So, um, Johnny said, "Okay, sim is what I'm thinking. I'm going to turn it up two more than what is manual." Yeah, I think that's a good place to start with sim variance. So, Johnny said, "It's interesting how low the projected score is for all these lineups." Yeah, I mean one thing is it's it's an ugly slate at the moment. There's no because all the, I mean, there's a ton of questionable players, but there's not really a lot, like no one's really gotten ruled out yet. 
Like there's no value. So all the projected scores are low because it's hard to build high projected lineups. Even on a slate where there is value though, don't, don't get lost looking at projected score, right? This ultimately doesn't mean anything. It doesn't, it, this is what the lineup does on average, but the average outcome isn't what pays you out anyway, right? Like when, when, when a lineup, if a lineup scores 400 points at the end of the night and thinks a contest, nobody cares that on average, that lineup was going to score 280. So Brad says, are you ever comfortable with anyone hundred percent on 20 plus lines? Yeah, absolutely. Depends on the slate. Um, at lock last night, I had a hundred percent Cameron Payne in 150 on FanDuel. Uh, that came down throughout the night. There was a report like before the Nuggets game started. I think at seven o'clock my time that Cameron Payne was going to be on a minutes limit because he was questionable or he was he was prof he was probable. And then it came out that he, his minutes were somewhat limited, and I think that brought my exposure down. We also then got the Thunder lineup which opened up a little bit more value. So when I late swapped, I ended up with lower than that. But I, I mean, I have, I have no problem being hundred percent on a player in 150 lineups on the right slate for a sport like NBA. It's a very, it's a lower variance sport. You know, average projections are a little bit more predictive um, of, of upside of the best plays. I'm fine with that on higher variance sports. Never like hundred percent exposure to somebody in 150 in like golf or NASCAR or something like that would feel like it's crazy, but that's, that's me. So, um, all right, cool. Brendan says, and we are going to make this our last question, guys. It's an hour and a half. Awesome stream today. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, last, last question. And this is kind of a fun one. Um, he said, how much are likely, how much more likely are USFL Sims if MLB is delayed? It's on our radar talking about it. Um, new league. Hardest thing is getting the data that we need to do the things that we need to do to simulate games. Right. It's a brand new league. Um, so there's not even always a lot of infrastructure set up to get data that you need. I mean, even I'm talking basic stuff, um, some kind of rates, that, that kind of thing to create Sims, but Football is football. I think the USFL has mostly NFL rules with a couple exceptions. I think I know they're handling penalties a little bit differently, at least in the way penalties can be reviewed. I don't know how much that affects Sims, but I think it's mostly NFL rules, which makes it easier to Sim. So it's on our radar for sure. I think DraftKings and Vandor are going to have big contests for it. So, um, Brad says, just curious there due to the risk of injury and whatnot, uh, if you may remove them just in case. Uh, that's a valid point. Anybody can get hurt any night. Um, it, it, if Just because I'm comfortable with 150 doesn't mean you have to be or anybody else has to be. Uh, I will take on the somewhat random risk of injury for a player and move on to the next night if all 150 of my lineups die in one fell swoop. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to. I, I think you know, if you said I'm not comfortable with more than 60%, 70%, 80%, 40%, whatever it is in your lineups, that's fine. Um, the lower your maximum exposure is that you're willing to have for any one player, the more diversified you are going to be, the less you, the, the wider range of results you're going to get in your lineups, but also the lower upside there is. So, but. Um, Johnny says, yes, uh, it has. I've learned a lot so much. Thanks a ton. Didn't even know what sim variance was. And I think it'll stop me from getting smoked some nights. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Well, I do the show every day, 2 PM Eastern. So come see me tomorrow. Um, we'll talk a little bit more. The one thing I'll leave you with here, um, is tonight is one slate tonight is just one slate. So, I mean, ultimately this is a process. This is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, I like wish you the best of luck tonight along with everybody else that's joined the stream here today. Um, but ultimately, uh, remember, this is a high variance game. This is a marathon, not a sprint. It is primarily about bankroll management and contest selection and patience um, to allow you the opportunity to, to realize your edge. So with that, we'll cut it off there. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, fun stream today. Long one. Appreciate all you guys. We'll be right back again tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, somebody in this stream take down the 333 on FanDuel tonight. Um, so cool. See you guys. Take care.